In a shocking 1700s historical document to black Americans, a German professor used the term Negro as a reference to black Jews both in Africa and in Portugal. The author also makes a clear distinction between the black Jews and black Moors. The Moors were largely a distinctly different mixture of black people, most of whom had converted to the Muslim faith. The author candidly points out that the black Jews were specifically targeted for the slave trade, and that the black Moors were intentionally avoided, and that the Negroes, also known as black Jews, were then sent to the Americas during the slave trade. Get your ebook and audiobook bundle today. Choose from the following three options. Option one. Get free copies of the original 1700s documents only. Option two, get an easy to read edited ebook plus free copies of the original 1700s document for a low price of ten dollars. Option three, get an audiobook for easy listening plus the easy to read edited ebook and also free copies of the original 1700s document for a low bundle price of fifteen dollars. Learn the real history they don't want you to know. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, the you know it rains on the just and the unjust. All right, so this is uh, in continuation of of the agricultural language that uh, you know we've been talking about. So um, so we'll use that to to get into this uh, this lesson. All right, before we get going, we're going to do a Hebrew nugget. It comes out of the book called "The Heritage of Our West African uh, Ancestors." In this particular section of the book, is talking about the Ashanti tribe. And it says that uh, Dr. Gerson Levi talks about Ashan, which is where Ashanti comes from, Ashan and his contribution of the same name found in the Jewish Encyclopedia. He says Ashan, town in the domain of Judah, but which was in the actual possession of Simeon. And then he gives the scriptures here. He said the primary meaning of the word uh, of the Hebrew word Ashan is smoke, and it is used primarily to describe a burning city, and secondly, the figurative destruction of Israel. So he he cites the Hebrew and English uh, lexicon of Brown, Driver, and Briggs as his source. The latter meaning, he continues, would be significant and certainly applicable to fugitives from Jerusalem. Then he goes into the word Amen. He says even the word Amen appears in both the Ashanti and Hebrew language. Uh, Professor uh, Ratri, an expert in the Ashanti language, cites an Ashanti hymn of thanks to the supreme being in which this word is used. According to this renowned scholar, the use of the word by the Ashanti precedes the arrival of Christian missionaries to West Africa. So the Christian missionaries can't take credit <clears throat> for the other language that was already being used before before they got there. You know, it's a good resource, just a little nugget about uh, you know, the name of the Ashanti tribe, where it comes from, and also the, the use of the word amen in this Hebrew connection. All right, so let's talk about the rains on the just and the unjust. So um, when we start talking about the rains on the, on the just and the unjust, we go back to the plowing that we had, you know, before the plowing can begin, we had to wait on the on the on the uh, on the former rains to come in, and the former leather rains was there, you know, one uh, after the uh, feast of tabernacles would come, so that the plowing can start because you can't plow until the rains come. So when he ta starts talking about raining on the just and the unjust, he's still referring to the, those rains that had to come in f in order for the fields uh, to be plowed. So keep that in mind, all right? And we're going to see how the world takes advantage of the of the plowing of the field. All right, so in Matthew 5, 44 through 46, he says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just. And on the unjust, for if you love them which love you, but reward have you, do not even the publicans the same. 
So in the idea of, of him plowing the field, he's saying, <clears throat> when, I, when we plow this field, uh, both the good and the bad, the, the evil and the just, I mean, the evil and the and the evil seed, good seed, however you want to put it, are both going to benefit from the rains. So he's saying, love your enemies. So he's saying, love our enemies. He's not talking about feeling. He's talking about how we respond, what we do. You know, we 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 get in the scripture and talks about love is patient, love is kind, all these type 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 things. So we we could get into that study as well. But he's saying that's my character because your enemies are taking uh, or get the benefit of my reins just like you do. All right. So let's take this this concept and let's go into the parable at the end of the week and the tears uh, in in Matthew that we that we've uh, looked at before, right? So um, in Matthew 13, it says uh, another parable he put, put forth unto them. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man with so of good seed in his field. But while man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So we got this scenario where, where the fields have been plowed because the rains have come. Right, and the 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 good farmers have gone out. They plowed the field that was prepared for them to to plow. They went out. They planted the seeds, the good seeds that, that were supposed to be planted, and they had to go to bed, had to go rest, and the enemy waited until they got through with their part and snuck in while they were asleep, and started planting his seeds in the same field that uh, that they had planted there. Now, they were asleep. They didn't know it. They had done their part. But then uh, they noticed something uh, when, it when, it, when it began to spring up, when it began to grow, uh, they noticed something. And so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, this thou not so good seed in thy field, from whence then hath it tares. He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bonds to burn, but gather the wheat into my barn. This is, you know, when we begin to understand the harvest and the plowing and all these things just comes even more powerful to me uh, because he, he's telling us the manner in which the enemy came in using the very blessings that the Most High had bestowed up on his own. And now the enemy is taking advantage of what was already created for his people. And so they come in, they change things up, they plant the seed in there, along with the good seed. Now, the enemy can only take advantage of what the Most High has already created, what he has already, the situations that he have already presented. He can't create his own thing. He has to use what's already there and manipulate. So, you know, we have to keep that thought in mind as we go along. Well, let's look at what, you know, what tares are and, and, and the characteristics of those things. So it refers to a weed called uh, uh, darnel, which looks exactly like wheat in its youngest uh, in its young stage. And in fact, only the expert can distinguish some species of this darnel from the true wheat. Later on, the differences are remarkable. The farmer, however, cannot pull up the weed when it is almost fully grown without seriously damaging the true wheat plants, which are growing alongside. And the reason it can't do it is because the, the, the Darnell intertwines its roots with the roots of the wheat plants. And so if they were to go just jerk it out, they would also jerk part of the root of the wheat out, and then it would inhibit the maturing of the wheat as well. So the damage, uh, you know, he, you know, he wouldn't be able to figure out a way how to pull it up without damaging the maturity 
of the wheat. I hope I hope we captured that. It's a spiritual principle in there. We're gonna talk about. It. So he had to let them both grow up all the way together, so that the wheat matures fully in the presence of the tear. And then that's when the harvest will come and the separation come. So the Darnell is an annual. Uh, I'm not gonna try to pronounce that word. It's sometimes called the bearded Darnell grass. It has four smaller seeds than wheat. And it's claimed that these seeds, when ground to flour, are poisonous, due perhaps to a particular fungus which develops in the seed itself. But doves can eat the darnel seeds and not be affected by it. So I'm not even going to get into how dove represents the holy rook, and the holy rook, uh, you, you know, can defeat the the seeds of the enemy every time. So that, that's just a little little nugget there. All right, so. We got two seeds. So we got to go back to Genesis because this concept is found in, in, in Genesis as well. There's two seeds. In Genesis 3 and 14, out of the fall, you know, Adam and Eve uh, and, 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 and Lucifer is, is, is having a conversation with the Most High. And it says that Yahuwah Elohim said to the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou all eat. Thou, you know, shall thou eat all the days of thy life, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Now listen, he's talking to the he's talking to the serpent. And he's saying, I'm gonna put enmity. You know, y'all gonna have issues with each other. I'm gonna put enmity between thee and the woman, personally, and also between your seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Two seeds. So he established that there's two seeds growing up together from the beginning. And not only are there two seeds, but just like the wheat and the tear, at some point, it's going to be very difficult to tear them apart. And so when he, when he starts talking about, you know, telling them apart he's saying you're not because we need an expert to be able to separate these two things out and you're not the expert so in the meantime while you're dealing with life and you're planted in the same place as your enemy and you got to grow up together and i'm going to present situations for you to mature and as you mature and 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 this other that you can't tell whether or not it's me or not or, or my seed or not. When y'all grow together, eventually things are going to begin to take shape. But only I, I'm the only one that's going to be able to separate those things out. All right. Now, we see in John 6, uh, you know, element of this. And Yeshua is talking to uh his disciples, not that, not just the twelve, but the seventy also. So he had he had a bunch of, you know, uh, disciples, particularly the seventy. That he was talking to, and he started saying some stuff that's that in the flesh. Boy, it's, it sounds kind of crazy. It just it really does, you know, because he was talking to them, and he was telling them that you know, you, you, if you're gonna follow me, you got to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Now, he's a man standing before them, standing in front of them, saying, y'all going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Well, that sounded, that sounded weird to them. And he knew it would because he knew they were going to leave. So he spoke in a way that, you know, they you can't hear it. All right, check this. So he said, this is that bread which came down from heaven, as your father did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said, said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And when Yeshua knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said to them, does this offend you? Does this offend, cause you, cause the ones, you know, to begin to distrust in the one in whom you ought to trust and obey. Does this word, what is what is what I'm telling you, offending you? 
So he's it's it's like he's he's doing some type of separation. So he knew it himself that his disciples murmured at it. He said unto them, Thus does offend you, and what and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. What what if you see that? How then you what, how are you gonna deal with that? It is the spirit that quickens the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are not spirit, they are life. I mean they are spirit and they are life. I mean, you, I'm not speaking to you about the flesh. I'm speaking spiritual principles. You're hearing me and you're thinking I'm talking about the flesh. He said, but there are some of you that believe not for Yeshua knew. Th this is key. Yeshua knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. He knew from the beginning who they were that they believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I to him that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. He received ones that he knew would betray him because that's what his father told him to do. He said, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So pretty much all of the 70, I don't know how many, but it said many of them, didn't walk with him no more. And then Yeshua looked at the 12 and asked them a question, y'all going to go to? Yeah. Will ye also go away? And then Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living Elohim. And sure answer them, have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. And he spoke of Jesus carried the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, why am I reading this? Because we got a situation here where Yeshua has an inner group of people. And within his inner group of people, he knows that they're not going anywhere because he said, I chose you. Simon is trying to console him and say, look, where are we going to go? But he already knew the answer to that question because he knew Peter was his. And, you know, and you should respond back to him saying, I know, I said, you know, I chose you. He said, but I also know one year the devil because I chose him too. It's crazy. All right. So he's saying, I've got to allow this, this devil to grow up with y'all while we all hanging out together. I'm not going to treat him any differently than I'm treating y'all, even though I know he's the devil. I'm going to give him the same opportunity, even though I know he's the devil. He's going to sit down at my table, even though I know he's the devil. Because there's something about the devil that's necessary in order for me to achieve my goal. We've got to grow up together because it's necessary. It's going to rain on the just as well as the unjust. The field has been plowed. He, the, you know, the enemy planted the seed. I allowed him to plant the seed. I allowed him to grow up with me because there's a purpose in that devil. All right, and so as we 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 you know we we later read, you know, where Yeshua is talking to uh, Judas, and Judas has betrayed him, and he calls him his friend, and he's talking to Peter, who is trying to prevent him from being killed, and he's he calls him Satan, calls the devil friend, and calls his friend. Satan. And so we have this dilemma of responding then the way that Yeshua responded, understanding that the two have to grow up together. And then we had to say, well, how then do we respond while the two grow up together? Because as they both mature and come into their own, they begin to show different characteristics where at one time you couldn't tell them apart. All right. This is, this is, this is a dilemma. 
And then we had to accept the fact that we're not expert enough to make the decision, make the final decision on who's who all the time. All right. And even if we figure out maybe who's who, he he doesn't give us an out. He said, love your enemies. All right. So in Hebrews 4, he tells us that he discerns. He's the one that discerns. He said, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man shall fall out to the same example of unbelief. For the word of Elohim is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints of Mary. is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In other words, there's nothing hidden before him. He can see who the enemy is, and he can see who's his. He know who the elect is, he know who's not. But he's the only one that can make this distinction because at one point we all looked the same. And that's what the scripture said. We, we were all uh, involved in the world at some point. We were all doing the things that the other nations do at one point. We all looked the same. If you had looked at me or some other people while we were doing everything that the world was doing and you had to make a decision, you would have quickly said, I was tear and not weak. You would have pulled me out and damaged my growth process because we don't have that discernment to be able to tell who's his and who's ain't all the time, right? So we had to leave that then up to him and we had to endure growing up together until the harvest all right so this is this is a challenge this is a challenge but we understand that it's the trial that's going to end up separating out the wheat from the tear because you know the response to the trial is going to end up being different for the wheat than it is for the tear all right so we go to first peter four and it says, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. I'm going to say that again. For then as much as, as uh, Amashiach has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise. I'm going to read that again. For as much then as Amashiach has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of Elohim. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. I'm going to read that again. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. We were doing the will of Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, reveling, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. We were doing what they were doing in the time past. Where and they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you. You're strange because you don't do what they do. You're strange because you're not in excess of the right. You're strange because you don't do what they do. You're strange. So who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in the flesh, but live according to Elohim in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. But ye therefore sober, be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer, and above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudge. Ask every man hath received as every man has received the gift. As every man has received the gift, we know that was by grace, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of Elohim. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of Elohim. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which Elohim give it. Don't go try to do more than what he gave you. Just be you. The Elohim in all things may be glorified through Yeshua HaMashiach, 
to whom be praise. Who gets the praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Then he says this line right here. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fire trial, which is to try you. As though some strange thing happened unto you. And we often find ourselves when these things happen to us, we think it's strange. Why is this happening to me? We get angry. You get angry at him. Why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this for me? But he's saying we should know that this is not a strange thing for us. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fire of trial, which is to try you. It's though some strange thing. That's happening to you. Do you not know that your your faith has to go on trial? Because it's this trial that's going to separate you from the tear. Because as as wheat matures and the wind begins to blow, representing the holy rug, wheat bends over, it bows down, it it submits. But that tear stands straight up as the wind blows. It doesn't bow. He said, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached, if, if something happens to you, you're rejected for the name of Hamashiach. Happy are you. Why are you crying? Be happy. For the spirit of glory and of Elohim rests upon you. That's a sign. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other man's matters. Yet, if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify Elohim on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of Elohim. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not? the gospel of Elohim. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore let them that suffer I'm going to say it again. Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of Elohim commit the keeping of their souls to him and well doing as unto a faithful creator. There has to be a separation. All right. <clears throat> Now, we have a dilemma, all right, because we're saying, on the one hand, that we 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 don't we can't tell the difference. You know, it might be that somebody's in their immature stage; they may not actually be tear; they might just be an immature weak because we and tear in, the, in in their immature stage look the same. So then he he gets into this discernment thing. All right, he said, this is what I want you to do. He said, he said, in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their, their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of Elohim. So there's a lot of stuff in there. So study those words. Then he says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. In other words, they're not changing. They have a form. They talk about it, but they're not changing. They're not using the power of the Holy Rule to change. This is a problem. We, now we can't tell when somebody doesn't use the power of the Holy Rule to change. We can't hardly tell. We can't tell from the wheat and the tear. And so he said, whether they are elect or not, from such turn away. For this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers love. So now we're supposed to use our discernment to stay away. Even if it is someone who may be of the household, but may be in a disobedient state, he said, turn away. He said, these people are always ever learning, always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Then he goes into this, uh, Janus and Jambers withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. So he's talking about, in this particular case, people who who are, are not his. And they're resisting the truth at every hand. Men of the corrupt mind represent uh, bait concerning the faith. 
He said, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, you know my purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came to me in Antioch, and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all you have delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Yeshua HaMashiach shall suffer persecution. Yea, and all that will live godly in Yeshua HaMashiach shall suffer persecution. Yea, and all that will live godly in Yeshua HaMashiach might suffer persecution. It, 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 it's a good chance or shall suffer persecution. It seems like a definitive statement. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. There's, there's a description here. Some people are just going to get worse and worse. Evil men going to get worse and worse. They're not going to get any better. They're just going to get worse and worse. But continue, thou in the, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned it, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Yeshua HaMashiach. All scripture is given by inspiration Elohim. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All right, so that's a lot. But he's talking to us about the two seeds. And he's talking to us about how, how to handle the two seeds, how to grow up among the tares. Because the characteristics that we're talking about here are beginning to rear their heads, you know, among us. And he's saying, how do we handle that? He said, from such, turn away. He said, because, you know, when you didn't know the difference of what, what spirit was being followed, he said, you, you're trying to have unity. You're trying to, you know, get people to see. You're trying to ask potentially those who are evil to give you grace. So he said from such turn away. Because you can't get evil to do good to you. Man, I hope that makes sense. And so he said, but there's a way I want you to act. There's a way I want you to move. I want you to move like I move. He said, because it rains on the just as well as the unjust. Understand the enemy has done this. I'm going to do the separation. And the great thing about when he does separation, he said there's a time for, you know, peace. And then there's a time for war. He said there's a time to love, but then there's a time to hate. So when he separates these things out, he separates the wheat from the dead. There's going to be one side and the other side. And he's going to look at us and say, okay, y'all, separation has taken place. It's time to hate. <laughs> y'all like it. And so we're going to go to war and destroy everything with a perfect hatred, the scriptures say. Because he, we're not going to do like, uh, like Saul did. So when he said kill all the Amalekites and Saul didn't kill everything. He said, "You're gonna do the. You're gonna go in a perfect, this perfect hatred uh, that, that I want you to have because it's gonna be clear and distinct as to who your enemy is. By that, when I make that judgment, when we all go through the fire, it's gonna be one side or the other. All right. So I just wanted to talk about the just and unjust for a minute. I open it up for any questions. If no questions, we'll." Uh, We'll call it a night. All right, Shannon.
Shalom, Mox. How you doing today? Better than I deserve. <laughs> um, you know, I have a couple of comments actually. Uh, so Satan's kids can actually do do his same characteristics, like you know, just show up as an angel of light, like show up a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever I meet someone new or, you know, uh, the Lord has someone pass through my life, even coworkers, I always ask the Lord to give me discernment on those types of people. And sometimes, you know, you don't always like, like what you were saying, you don't always know, you know, because they could talk a good game, but then, you know, they, they're not, you know, you know, a tree by its fruit, basically. Yeah, they talk a good game. But like you said, it's it's how it's the response to troubling situations oftentimes that reveal where somebody is. You get what I'm saying? So you, we look at it today, all these people who have labeled themselves believers and Christians. And you know, we're looking at simple things in the word that says, love thy neighbor as you do yourself. You know, and then you say, well, okay, if 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 something happened in the United States and I had to leave and I had to take my family and we had to run and try to preserve my family and I had to go to Mexico, would I want to be treated like I'm treating the people that's trying to come in to the United States? What, you, you know, you, you get what I'm saying? Is this how I want to be treated? And if the answer is no, then I'm not loving then my neighbor as I do myself. If, you know, if, 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 a, if somebody's trying to get a loan at a bank and you say, well, I'm not going to help them out because they are a different people. You know, but then you go try to get along and they won't help you out because you have a different people. Is that how you want to be treated? The answer to that, no, unlikely, no. So you're not treating them, them like you would want to be treated. It's simple, simple things. You know, we, 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 we send our kids to school. They get called out of their name. Well, do you want your kids to go to school and get called out of their name? Why are you teaching your kids to do that? Then you're not treating me like, yeah, yeah. It's it's simple, simple stuff. And so you begin to start recognizing these things in in these in people, and you say at the very at the very uh, least, at the very least, they 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 may be his and they're not walking according to the spirit. At the least, at the most. They belong to a whole nother seat. Either way it go, he said, turn away from it. Am I making sense on that? Yes, sir. So, all right, so we, we have to make discernment and quit trying to beg people who potentially may be the devil to give us grace, to help us. Then I'm going to say this. There's only one restrainer. You know, we started talking about when we read this scripture where it says that those who are, who are not his are just get worse and worse. And I made the comment about, you know, there being no bottom. In other words, there's no restraint. They get worse and they get worse. And if the if the Holy Rule doesn't if it's most high doesn't, doesn't doesn't interfere with the whole you know by implementing some barriers there it wouldn't stop because he's the restrainer y'all get what i'm saying he restrains it he keeps it but there's a point in the book of revelation where he removes all seven of those seals representing the holy root and we begin to see what it's like to live in a time of no restraint How far can this thing go? Yeah, so I uh, just wanted to, just wanted to say that. You know, there's a lot of scripture we we'll 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 go over to to show that. But uh, yeah, that, that's kind of where we are, uh, Mr. Jones.
Oh, my, what's good? Shalom. Um, I have three parts, three part question. Um, one is when you were talking about um, all that live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. And when I saw, um, when you said that, instantly popped into my head, like uh, the body of Christ, the church always preach um, the victory, this, that, and the other, but they never preach the flip side of that coin as far as like the persecution and the scripture that popped up in my head was um, in Peter where it says uh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and people kind of stop there, mm -hmm. but it also said in a fellowship, fellowship. of his sufferings mm -hmm. with an S, you know, everything that Christ went through, we are in some way, shape or form at some point in time, we may be able to go through as well. I just wanted you to speak on that. That's one. The second was uh, when you said, uh, you know, evil men shall wax worse and worse. Is this the correlation between when they had uh, in Babylon, Christ, uh, God said that, um, you know, now that now that man is one, they will do whatever their imagination shall do. And their imagination was only evil. It was no good in it. Everything that they can imagine to do was evil is that also a part of like the mystery of iniquity Absolutely. like it's going to get worse and worse it's not going to get any better mm -hmm. we keep hoping that it is but it's not the third thing is when i read um years ago years ago when i was first uh opening up to the lord and reading the bible i found i found it interesting to say the least that um when it said um you know uh what it said john 6 Six six, we said you know they they walk no more with. I just found it interesting that that that, that chapter and verse was John six six six, <laughs> you know, and it stuck with me. And then you brought it up. So those are the three um, components that I had in my mind. If you could speak on any of them, that'd be great. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. So you, the scripture where he talks about you know that we might know him, you know. Uh, you know, he he tells us all the time, you know, that he wants us to be like him, to love like him, to, you know, to have his character. Right. And the only way to test that character uh, to see if we if we're like him is to put us in situations like similar to what he was in. Mm -hmm. And so the response then is going to tell uh, whether or not I'm walking like him or not. You know, it makes sense if, if yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of like. It's kind of like uh, in the natural when a man has a child, you know, regardless of how faithful he thinks his wife is or regardless of whatever, he has a child by her. He wants to look at that child and see himself. <laughs> DNA, every man, baby, every, DNA, every, every, baby. Every, every man <laughs> in here know what I'm talking about. You can deny it to you, but that's okay. You know, I understand. But every man wants to see himself in and that's the nature that we get from our father. He wants to see himself in us. Are we taking on his characteristics? Are we acting like, responding like he would respond? And so that includes when we suffer. And then when you go to Romans 5, he talks about uh, rejoicings in our tribulation. Because somehow our tribulation going to work out he says some patience and then our patience going to work out. Uh, you know, uh, you know, he goes down the line. I think he said some, uh, you know, uh, some hope and then hope, you know, make it not a shame. So he goes down this list of how, uh, you know, even rejoicing in our tribulations is an attitude that he would like for us to have. So that's, so we have to go through the things in order for it to be tested out to see uh, how we're going to respond. Not how we feel, but how we respond. You know, you know, I, I'm better today than I was, but I'm not always passing. <laughs> you know? right. So I'm not proud of that, but it is what it is. But you, you, you go back and you, you, you continue to grow and do. But that's that's the challenge, fellowship of suffering. Uh, but then when he says the fellowship is, you know, of, of suffering, he, like you were saying, he talks about the power of the resurrection because he does, I don't want to be too long winded here, but what, 
you know, my daughter asked me a question last night, and she was she was, and, and it was along these lines. And I was explaining to her. I said, you know, I said when a man uh, marries a woman, he likes to have the confidence that she married him. He married. She married him for himself. That it wasn't the things that he had. Y'all get what I'm saying? Y'all get that, that that you love me for me. Well you know? And so. And then I was explaining to her that it is difficult for someone who already acquires wealth to trust the fact that somebody loved them for them and not for what they have. And even if you acquire somebody who who comes over with you, there's always this doubt: Do you love me for me? Y'all gotta say. And so, the Most High puts us through a test. Those that are His. And he says, I'm going to give you stuff because I'm y'all I'm, I'm all by myself. I'm going to give you what I promise. He said, I promise I'm going to give you everything. I got your treasure stored up in the heavens for you. I, I, I got mansions. I got, I got all these great things for you. But I'm not going to give you the stuff before you get me. <laughs> you got you to gotta get me first before you get stuff. And so only those who love him first will be able to endure what it takes to get to the stuff. Man, I hope that makes sense. So he's not going to, if if you're the type that has to have the stuff to stay with him first, you ain't going to make it. And so then he starts talking about, that's why he started talking about the, 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 the fellowship of his suffering and the power mm -hmm. right of his right. resurrection. <laughs> He said, then that's why he said, if you suffer with me, you shall reign with you me. You're gonna reign with me. Yeah, yeah, get what I'm saying? So yeah. it's this process. You can make it through the process with me, Israel. And not cry all the way through the wilderness. And act like I'm not gonna do what I'm I said I'm gonna do. Then you can enter that promised land. <laughs> Man, this this is this is this serious serious business. So um, when we get to the book of Revelation, we see that, and what we don't what we what we don't recognize, I think, in the book of Revelation, is that those who are dying are the faithful, right? And those who are still alive are the ones who are refusing to repent. <laughs> well, you you get it. You get it. So uh, so that's it, uh, Fellowship uh, uh, Suffering. I like what you're saying about Babel. That's been on my mind all week. At the Tower of Babel, he, he had to intervene, like you were saying, because he said that they had, n there was nowhere for them to stop. He said right. they're going to do everything. And when I read that, I'm like, them. if you can imagine anything, it's, it said their imagination waxed uh, evil continuously. Continue. It's like you can't think of nothing good, nothing. It's like you have the freedom to do anything you want, and it's always evil. It's always evil. And he said it was getting worse, worse, worse. And he had to intervene and confound the languages so they couldn't communicate with each other to have unity in the evil. And we don't see a common language again until Yeshua is resurrected. He goes into heaven and he sends down the Holy Ruach to his believers. He doesn't give this gift to non-believers because they can you know, do the same thing they did at Babel. But to believers who are walking in the spirit, he is saying, now you should, you can, you know, when it's necessary, you can hear each other talk in the same language regardless of what country you're from, what language you're speaking, you can now, you know, because your heart is back towards me again. I don't have to worry about you just being evil continually because I chasing those whom I love. I, I got a barrier there for you. You're just not going to just be able to just, just do anything for any length of time without the chasing it. So there's, there's a bottom for you. Mm. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. All right. So then, uh, yeah, that last one, John six, six. I think you're dead on there. You know, they just they took on that spirit of unbelief, and he starts talking. You know, taking on his body. You know, eating his body and drinking his blood. That's that's that was crazy to talk to them. But the eleven stayed. Like, I may not even. I don't even know what this dude is talking about. <laughs> but. <laughs> I believe <laughs> you know, I don't quite understand what you're talking about, but I'm not going anywhere. Sure. You know. And so yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think uh, yeah, that's uh, you know, like you said, that the where it was located in scripture, I think is powerful as well. So I hope that kind of answered it. I kind of long winded, but No, it's all gravy. All right. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. Uh Dante, Cherie. Shalom, Ak. Shalom. So this is really good. Um, you know, I I uh, have talked with Sheree about 2 Timothy 3, and I've talked with my daughter about it and how, how it's actually unfolding before our eyes present day. And and so to, earlier you you were reading through uh, 2 Timothy 3, and you uh, got to the 13th verse, and it says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so I, I have just a kind of a quick question. Present day, what are you noticing and what does it look like with the evil men deceiving and being deceived and waxing worse and worse? As we as we watch how the world is is going in the direction it's going, what does it look like today? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, people think it's it's about politics or it's about, you know, you don't like this a certain candidate and everything. You know, and I, I look at like what, what a Trump embodies. You know, uh, and, and I'm not saying, you know, one party is better than the other, but I'm just saying what's out front right now and what everybody's willing to say is okay. And the most high has allowed him to be out front and allowed us to see all of the things that he represents and allows us to see that he has increased his support every year since 2016. And that what he prophesied, when he said I could go out and shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue, and they still don't love me. Has come to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You understand? Every year, his numbers go up. The more evil is shown, the more people gravitate to him. That's a sign of something else going on. That the moral integrity is getting worse and worse. And if you've had the opportunity to read what they got planned for us, they ain't done yet. And there's only one thing that's going to help us or intervene, and I'm not sure exactly at what point he's going to, uh, uh, you know, stop it, because the scriptures is telling us these things are going to get worse and worse and worse. You know, so that's what I'm seeing now. It's just, you know, it's just, there's this agreement in evil. And it's an it's a evil in the name of Jesus. I, I, I hate you in the name of Jesus. That's wild to me. So is it, is it, is it accurate in, in, to say that noticing all of this hatred and all this evil and all these people coming into agreement with that stuff in the name of Jesus, is it, you think it's accurate to say that we're starting to see the tears separate from the wheat? Mm. I think so. I think so. And uh, it's, it's becoming more and more obvious. And he's getting us to a point where, you know, if we're obedient to what he's asking us to do, we're going to separate ourselves. See, for a long time, we tried to be with people. 
hoping they're going to change, this change was going to come, hoping they would see this or hoping they could see our point or hoping that they would just understand where, we, <laughs> you know, where we were coming from, all these things, you know, that's not happening. Holding hands and singing Kumbaya. You know, you know <laughs> quoting Martin Luther King that we might be judged, you know, not oh, by God. the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. They teach all their kids that and then they do the opposite. Yeah, come on, y'all. And so it's oh. it's 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 becoming so obvious now. Who's speaking words? He's saying, separate yourself from me. if you in their church and they ain't changing. Separate yourself from. Churches. That's it, Doc. If you are in a church, separate. Now, separate. That, that's hard for a that's lot of hard. people. That's hard. I'm just saying what he said. If we go down that list and compare the definitions of those words to the people that we're living among who call themselves believers, and those words describe those very believers. And at the end of that list, he says, separate from them type. And I don't. Then I deserve everything that happens while I'm integrated. Mm -hmm. Y'all get what I'm saying? So we can't make people change. So when you, when you say that, it's kind of like that. In my head, it's like beating a slave and telling them, telling them it's for their good in the but name it, of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You whipping a slave, you telling them it's it's for the name, it's in the name of the Lord, and it's for their good. Yeah, and that's that's what they're doing. It's crazy, and it's gonna get worse. Mm -hmm. And we have to have the discernment to see it. And then we have to be able to go back in history and understand that we're nowhere near as close. We're nowhere near what they were doing then. I remember they did a survey about 20 years ago. And they asked the question, they, they asked, uh, you know, uh, you know, certain people's the question, if you had the ability, and I can't remember exact the exact number, but they said if you had the ability to just do what you want without consequence, you know, or, or you go out and rape women, would you rape And 70%, I believe, 70% said they would. If they could just do it and no, nothing comes back on them. Think about that. No restraints. That was 20 years ago. The evil was already present to say I would do it if I had no restraints. That's deep. All right, Samson? Yeah, yeah, Shalom. Yeah, that is deep. I remember I remember that statistics. And it was like, uh, I think it was the majority of white men that said they were, had no problem raping them because it reminded me, I think it was Dr. Uh, the, the group where she came up with the term post-traumatic stress syndrome, where she interviewed a whole bunch of uh, predominantly white men and said they would have no problem raping a woman if, if it was legal. But um, keeping the same topic with what you were talking about uh, and, and the disservice the church did, just imagine if they can take this message you gave as a prerequisite to every new believer where you have to suffer. Just imagine if Isaiah uh, 5310, where it pleases the father, to, it pleased the father to bruise his son. Imagine if that was a prerequisite for new believers. And I think of my brother Corey and Judy and James, and, and I think of what Abraham went through with potentially sacrificing his son, what David went through with the sexual perversion going through his family, with Uriah, Bathsheba, um, and I think of Job, the suffering he went through. That pleases our father. It pleases the father to bruise us. Why? Because it's a buffering that happens. It, it's a it's a it's a weakness. It's a breaking down of our ego that we're nothing without his blood. We're nothing without him. And, and just imagine if that was a prerequisite 
for every new believer and not this churchianity, this watering down of, of our father or our Christ being a hippie, we would be so much further. Because especially as the hearts of many waxes cold, as this world gets more wicked, if we have the mindset that we're going to go through some suffering, but it's for our good, where we always got a posture of stay, getting up, where like uh, Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs and Psalms, where the wicked fall and don't give up, the, but the just will fall seven times and get back up. So we always going to have a posture of getting back up. And it pleases him. I, th I think we'll be stronger believers. I think I think we can go through more. We we in the midst of our battles, we can look at somebody and pray for them and encourage them and sow seed into them. But this this fickling, feckless leadership, you know, like so yeah, it, it was good though. Uh, it was good. Appreciate yeah. you. Yes, sir. All right, yeah, and, and you know, and I feel you, you know, uh you know, it, it is easy for us. I'm I'm guilty at times to get mad at the, you know, leadership or whatever. But we had to look at it from a global, global perspective, a macro perspective, if I if I would, and understand why we're here. We're here because of what our ancestors did. And you know, he said that this would happen because of that. He said we would go into these other nations. We would serve gods that, you know, our fathers have not known. And that's why we got all this false worship stuff. But thanks be to him and his grace and mercy, he's opening up our eyes and he's allowing us to come out of that now. So we had to go through it. It was part of it. Uh, I'm just thankful for his grace and his mercy. But I feel you. All right, Hank. Hey, Shalom, Mark. Shalom, everybody. I wanted to um, really appreciate um, Dante's comments um, just a second ago, and his his that last comment he made about the, you know where we are and being able to you know we're starting to see this distinguishing between uh, the wheat and the tares. Uh, I just think that's really important. I think we've been going through that. Um, in a significant way since 2020, um, me personally. And we, we we can look at our our justice system here um, in our country, and we can see that, you know, what judgment looks like. You know, you know, somebody commits a crime, and then they're charged with a crime, and then they go into the court of law, and, you know, arguments are, <clears throat> are you know, presented, you know, to either prosecute and, and the defendant tries to defend himself. And over the course of the you know, the, the 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 court uh, case, it becomes more and more obvious who's right and who's wrong. And then the judge makes a final determination, and then the sentencing occurs, and then the you know the actual punishment takes place. And so I, I think we're, we're we're you know our justice system, our criminal justice system. We're going through, you know, I don't think that's just a, a natural thing. I think that's a spiritual concept. I think we're going through that right now. Uh, and and, and uh, since 2020, uh, it, it is becoming more and more obvious as to who the sides are, you know, who and, and you know, who the right and the wrongs are now. I, I really appreciate it, you know, the teaching tonight because we're not the final judge. And so we we cannot say you know, look at somebody and say that person's wrong and and then and, and just completely write them off as if as if we're the final judge. We can't do that. But we have to be, we have to, you know, ex exercise some discernment. And and that's you know, and so Dante's initial question and about uh Second Timothy, what you brought out and that that chapter verse 13, it says evil men and seducers. And we talked a lot about about the evil men, but I'm wondering, could you talk a little bit more about the seducers? Because that's a whole lot of that going on. And, and, and we're not only being seduced in church, but we're being seduced online. You know, the, there are people that are saying some things and they, they sound good. You know, they, you know, it sounds pretty close. But then uh, you, know, you just start digging into them. Um, they'll say something. Uh, and you realize, I mean, this this person ain't really who they they think they're. I'm wondering, hoping that you could talk a little bit more about the seducer 
aspect of that that scripture. Yeah, I mean, uh, man, seduction. You know, seduction. You know, oftentimes we talk about seduction. We talk. We we think of it from us from a sexual perspective, and that's that that too is a um, is a big part of 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 what we see in society from a sexual perspective. But really, from a from the perspective of the harlot, the woman, the proverbs. Is it Proverbs eight? I can't remember now, but I have to go and look. Proverbs eight or nine. It talks about that that woman, the seducer, and he's talking about the spirit, the 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 the, the whore of Babylon. She has a spirit about her, and it's not just you know he uses sexual connotations in the language because we understand that we understand seduction from that, but really the seduction is that whole list of things of the characteristics that's presented in that, in the, you know, to uh, lasciviousness, the, the, uh, the covetedness, wanting what everybody else has, you know, all of these characteristics that's listed there is part of the seduction. I want you to start wanting the things of the world. I'm going to convince you that you can have the things of the world that you, you know, this, this dream, you know, if you follow along with us, if you line up, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, our next president, he's going to be able to do this. He's going to be able to do this. You line up with us, you'll be able to get this and you'll be able to get that. And so we compromise our whole belief systems that we grew up with in order to get what they're offering. It's, it's a seduction. And right now, we've seen uh, over the years, this seduction, this, 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 this is growing. You know, women started getting uh, messages after the election saying stuff like, uh, you know, uh, your body, my choice. You know, because before the election, it was my body, my choice. After the election, it's your body, my choice. And, you know, the connotations behind that goes right back to the to the rape thing that we were talking mm -hmm. about. It's seducing people into a mindset that they can just do as they will against other people. And so that's kind of what I see when we when we when we start saying and we really need to, you know, in order to do that some justice, and I apologize because I don't think I am, we need to go down that list of of characteristics that's that's described there. And that right there tell us everything we need to know about what the seducers are trying to pull us into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally agree. And we we, ha we have to be sensitive to that. Um, um, you know, we've got folks out there that are doing everything they can to get you to like them to get you to love them, to get you to friend them, to get you to subscribe to them, to get you to do all these, these things. Uh, and so, you know, they'll, and they'll say whatever it is they need to say to make it sound good. Uh, and then you, you combine that with, you know, our, our itching ears as well. It just, it's just uh, an incredible recipe uh, for disaster on, you know, for us, if we're not uh, exercising discernment. And being willing to separate ourselves, even when you know, it seems like you know, you know it, that ain't so bad, or or the old dreaded, well, you know, they got a good heart, you know. So you know that that, that stuff gets you in trouble. And we just got to be willing to say, okay, you know, this is this is the line uh, that cannot be crossed, given that you know those those descriptors, those adjectives in in First Timothy that we know is just going to continue to get worse and worse as we continue to go through. Yeah, yeah, we definitely got to learn how to separate ourselves instead of, like you were saying, seduced into, you know, saying, you know, come over here. I know we're good people, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but doing the things that's on that list, we had to separate. Yeah. You know, and, and, and seduction, the seduction of it makes it look like it's okay. And before you know it, you're in it and you don't even realize it, that you're in it. You know, so there, there are Hebrews out there that are seducing too. Mm -hmm. Oh um, yeah, they're claiming they're woke, but it's because they have itching ears. I they're think that, there's always levels to this. It starts with that itching ear, like listen to this prophet or this prophet or this this Walmart preacher. You know, it starts with looking for more than what's there and right. and denouncing the Holy Ghost and, and leading him into lead, let him lead us in the truth. Yeah, you know? those guys are looking for get back. That's what they're doing.
Yeah. And so growth, growth or or diminishing is in in steps. You, you gradually grow in and, and you wax stronger or you, you wax evil. Right. <laughs> you know, but, uh, go ahead, Mr. Danks. Um, as I, as we go through more and more of the studies, um, the thing that keeps being oppressed upon my heart, and I was wondering maybe at some point if we would be able to really go into a deep study uh, into this, this thing called Christianity that most of us have come out of and are still, uh, you know, dealing with the after effects because as I as I study more and and read history and watch some videos, it's 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 dawned upon me how much of an influence the Catholic Church has had on uh, uh, had an influence on what what most of the world calls Christianity and you know evangelicals because you know I and I'm not knocking anybody on here so i'm not i'm not picking on anybody so if anybody if this strikes a nerve with anybody i apologize but the wearing of crosses and um still dealing with some of the the residuals of uh this catholicism or this constantine uh christianity uh, because as I read the scriptures, I, I cannot find anywhere where Christ is telling his disciples and those who they baptize and, you know, uh, come into the body that, you know, this is the moniker that you need to take on in order to be identified as mine and all these other things. Everything that you're teaching and you're saying, there's, it's a different identification that identifies you as uh, being a disciple of Yeshua or, or a believer in, you know, Yahuwah and all the things that the scriptures talk about. So I would appreciate just a, a going back, maybe at some point, maybe next year, we go back to the very, very, very beginning and work our way up to the cross and talk about how how did the Romans have such an effect on what we know today as Christian? Are there still residuals of that in the church? And how can we identify those things so that we can stay away from them? Um, because I, I feel frustrated at times because I'm trying to talk to people um, because I was part of the um, the International Churches of Christ um, um, as I was coming up. And, you know, they had leadership and you, you could be in ministry and I could see like there was there was this 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 hidden racism within the church, like if a brother wanted to be with a sister and they happen to be of another persuasion like oh well you're not in the ministry so you can't date this person and and it was there was all these different things and then there was a huge blowout with a letter that came out and it was just it was just a lot of things and I feel like we got sucked into this this belief system that that didn't correlate with the scriptures, like even churches today, as you look at some of the things online, no one is talking about who the true Hebrews are. No one's talking about Judah. No one's talking about, you know, reconciliating with the people of the book, which obviously would be us. And, you know, you've got all these uh, um, uh, individuals that would be considered um, uh, uh, what's the word? I, I, I'm, I lost my train of thought. Um, those who are not Judah, um, I don't want to say Edomites, uh, <laughs> but the, the the Gentiles, you know, those individuals who have accepted Christ and are in this thing called Christianity, I don't hear anyone talking about reconciliation and, and all these other things like taking responsibility for what has happened. So I would, I would appreciate, and I apologize for taking so much time saying this, but I would appreciate being able to go back from the beginning and going through and looking for those tears, looking for those things in this thing that we call Christianity, like what what are the tears? Where's the wheat? What what should we hold on to? What should we not be holding on to? What is not of Christ? You know, Christ didn't say do this. You know, why are we doing these things and so on and so forth? But I digress. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. We can we can we can do something, you know. It's it's so much, you know. 
<laughs> but but yeah, yeah, we can go back to the beginnings and and look at it. I think we got we got to go for back further than Rome because when you get the Mystery Babylon, Mystery Babylon has collected all of them together. The, Absolutely, because they're, they're, they're brothers that I that I that I that I that I grew up with. Some of them I baptized, and they're still hanging on to some of these false teachings that are still being perpetuated within the evangelical church. And it's so hard for them to come out of that. And it's like you even bring up the Hebrew thing, and oh, you know they, you know. So it's like even without even bringing up, okay, well, man, the DNA evidence is out there. The scientific evidence is out there. This, you know, even, even the people on the other side have admitted it and they still can't see that. And then when you bring up the other things, like, why are you, why are you wearing these crosses? And why are you, you know, doing certain things that, that, that are, that have this, this flavor of, of this Roman Catholic, why are you still doing these things in seven? And they get upset. So, I just want to have the tools that I need to be able to um, uh, um, not politic, but to uh, reason with these individuals that I love and give them an opportunity to, to maybe even go through some studies or maybe even get point them to some videos that, that, you know, or some information that you provide that we can say, hey, look, man, here's because everything, you know, I keep coming back, like everything that you're doing is just so uh, thorough and you know you know that the spirit is there because it's just it, it, it all just meshes and, and, it, and it all just clicks and it would be nice to be able to have the resources I guess to be able to, to point some of these things out but if you want reason with them Joseph then uh, be ready to uh, offend them because the minute you say Christianity was birthed from Catholicism you're going to offend them you know like that, that word boule gatekeepers you know, they, it was people who kept the gate, like Elder said, you know, you got to go past Rome, maybe go to the Hellenes, the Hellenistic era. And then you're talking about our black pastors. They're all in a fraternity, a Greek fraternity. Bula, yes. So, I mean, yes. Yes. How deep you I, had, go? I had a huge, uh, well, I did not, a, I didn't have a debate, but I pointed out some things. There was a, there was a thing on Facebook with these guys, but this brother was a news anchor talking about, you know, there was this huge uproar about these hand symbols and he was trying to clarify it. And my thing was just, you know, why is it that we as a people are always looking to connect to something outside of the most high God? Why is it that we need these boules and these fraternities and these secret societies? And, oh, we were Egyptians. Oh, we were, you know, from Kemet and all these other things. Why is it that we're always clinging to the thing that, 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 it's not ours it doesn't belong to us we it's so easy for us to accept these other things rather than to accept that we are we belong to the most high god and the only thing i can keep coming back is that we want to play god we love being god there's no accountability on the other side we love our sin and as long as we're able to to continue within sin and not be challenged i'd rather accept this because it's easier if I have to face my sin and have to repent and have to realize that I've been living in a lie and that there's accountabilities that I'll have to, you know, answer to, you know. So, yeah, I get it, man. It's 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 hard, but it's, and it, and it's so hard to see the people that you love and the people you come up with that they refuse to accept the truth, man. And it's frustrating at times, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's frustrating. But at the same time, you know, we have we have a promise. You know that you know he's he's gonna open up the eyes. He's gonna do it, and so he'll give us the tools we need it, uh, to say we need to say when we need to say it. So yeah, uh, Dante, Sheree, Shalom, everybody. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I'm kind of backtracking a little bit. Uh, I was not in my head a lot to what Brother Jay Daniels was just saying because truly you know, just to kind of toggle on to his observations about, you know, the Christian church, the Constantine church. Some of them are even doubling down on their racism. They are, they're holding on to that and they're not going to let it go. And that's definitely one way you can see. I think we're noticing every day, like, oh, this is what the scripture means by the wheat and the tares. How are you doubling down on this foolishness like this? Um, but I definitely, I can identify with what he's feeling and thinking and observing 
about those institutions and organizations. They really are doubling down, in some cases, tripling down. I mean, we saw something so crazy. Dante sent it to me. It said, um, you know, the newly elected president, son of man. What did it say? The Christ. I mean, this, people are posting these kinds of things. They mm. are really losing it or have lost it or never had it. I don't, I'm not sure. But I just wanted to go back to the um, uh, Brother Hank talking about the seducers. I think those of us who have children in our homes, we should be super vigilant. Because, you know, I'm kind of a little bit overgrown, folks. Because we've been told by friends of ours, you know, don't talk to us no more about that. Don't bring that up no more. We don't want to hear it. We good. We live in life until whatever happens, happens. So please stop talking to us about these things. And so I'm like, okay. But the children, younger and younger, are being seduced into ideologies and beliefs and almost being shamed and ostracized by friend groups when they don't believe what the friend groups are believing. And that is true, definitely, of one of our children. Um, our younger child is very outspoken and well-spoken and articulate, and she'll let you know she don't care, you know, because she's in middle school and they're coming to school with all these different beliefs and colors and things. And she let them know, um, I don't believe in that. We don't do that at my house. And you can stay over there with that. And and it's amazing because already at 11 and 12 years old, the other children are like, well, you know, you're a homophobe or you, you know, why don't you believe that? And And I think we need to be very, very vigilant over our children because they're going to grow up and the world is, I'm telling you, Praying is an understatement. The things that they believe and are holding fast to so young just makes me go, oh, the world is going to be so scary. They truly have already, it started in elementary school. They've truly already been seduced by demonic forces, satanic beliefs that do as thou wilt um, type of living and our children go out and they are they are sheep among wolves already. So just we work as hard as we can. They probably get tired of us, but the world is truly, I mean, if people are having a hard time envisioning how the worse is gonna get worser, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's gonna you know, the scripture we just went through. Um, chat with a child. Just chat with them. They're already, they're waxing cold. The love is, nope, already. And they're young. Talk with a child. And, and pick their brain about what they believe about certain things that you think, oh no, this is what we believe in our household. Pick their brains about it. And you'll, you'll get an, an eye-opening experience. And I can see how it's going to go from, yeah, we, oh, you think we're at the worst. Just wait. They're going to be adults. And, yeah. they're, and they've are and they already got these formed concepts and schema and ideologies that are so different from their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents. These children believe in things we could not have imagined at their age. And... I don't know about y'all in this household. We're not that old, but, <laughs> you know, just, and even for us, we could not have imagined that children would think and believe the things that they do. So. Yeah. Like it's, I said, it's, it's out there. I mean, it's, it's wild. I was in the uh, grocery store line and this, it was a young girl. She was, she was a uh, cashier. And another girl was coming to the line and she had some tattoos. And then they just started talking about, Oh, you you do you read tarot cards? And I mean, they just talking about this stuff like it was just normal stuff in the grocery line. So they were gonna get together, and, you know, <laughs> talk about tarot tarot cards and all that type of stuff. So this is like you said, it's normal stuff. 
for them is is beginning to happen. And I say this, and I I hit uh, my my keys up. But when we study, you know, and I and I keep harping on the Inquisition and all that type stuff, so that we can see how low things were back then. And if we understand how low things got back then, and y'all didn't hadn't didn't didn't intervene on a major behalf, I hope you hear what I'm saying. We can get that low again. All right. So we were getting persecuted, I mean, harshly forced to worship in a certain way. Christianity, and then the Muslims came. They were doing the same thing. So we were being persecuted in, uh, you know, ran out of Spain, being persecuted, burned at the stake and all these things. Because you got to worship this way. You got to believe this way. The Muslims came in, said the same thing. So here we are, betwixt and between, two systems. You know what I'm saying? One, our brother Esau, who hates us, and the other one, our, our, our um, you know, our uncle, Ishmael. Y'all, y'all, y'all ain't put all that. I, Ishmael already mad at Isaac for a minute. Esau mad at Israel and just so happened these are the two religions that dominate us and persecute us for not following uh, and it was brutal it was brutal it was brutal and so when I see somebody stand up in 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 in, in the Congress, and and they're saying we're going to force people to start teaching the Bible in school again. You know, if if you're an immature believer, that sounds good. But if you understand the version of Christianity that's going to be taught, this is not a great idea. So you're going to talk to the average one of us who ain't in the Word. Who, who are part of the system and somebody going to say, oh, put the Bible back in school. That's all they're going to hear. And they're going to sign the petition for their own persecution. And don't realize they slaughtered. They fought wars. You know what I'm saying? Talking about in the name of Jesus. In the name of Allah. And here we were caught in the middle. Just like now. So we, we, we've got to see what happened before so we can understand what can happen again. Okay, Marquise. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I got you. Oh, quick. Um, did you make a correlation if there is any about the text that you spoke about the wheats and the tares and um what is it uh matthews chapter 7 verse 24 through 27 you know where he um said you know those who hear these sayings of mine build their house upon a rock same thing happened upon those who built their house upon sand you know is there is there a correlation between the wheats and the tares like you said earlier yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, the the two systems. You know, when you read these, when you read, I mean, it's in it's in the KJV. We can see, it, but these two systems that come up is 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 two is two different religions, and all of the you know these two systems is, is the truth and 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 falsehood. You know, one true system and the other is false falsehood, and the falsehood can comprise of different compartments. Falsehood can com comprise of both Constantine Christianity plus, uh, you know, you know how you want to say Catholicism plus Hinduism plus, uh, you know, uh, the Muslim plus, plus anything you know the Greek the the Masonics all of that can go into that other system, and then you got the truth. 
So you got two different systems that's going on. And then you have to say, okay, what, what, because the, because the lie doesn't care what, care what system it uses, as long mm -hmm. as it can perpetrate, perpetrate the lie. So any one of those other systems that you build on, you're building your house on sand. Because when the trouble come, you know, it, the, it, whatever you got built on it, it's not going to stand. But the rock, which is representative of our Messiah, if your house is built up on that, then after the storm goes through, you still stand it. And so, I, you know, it's the, it, it is the wheat and the tear. It all falls in, in the, into that same in that same category. All right. Any, anybody else? All right. That's good. Good discussion. Good discussion. So it's it's a lot that we've got to consider, and and uh, so I, I'll see. I, I you know we'll see what most high leads us on on that part. You know, going through and just looking at the two systems. Like we you know we've kind of done that before. You know, especially you know I, I tried to do that. Started off in Negro Land where we where we kind of did that. I was showing you. The real Messiah versus the false Messiah, you know the two systems, what they look like, how to identify them. So maybe we can use that that strategy to to uh, go into it a little bit deeper and talk about it. So, all right, let's get on out of here then, Father. We just want to thank you for this opportunity that you've given us. This opportunity, Father, to to grow in our discernment, to grow in you, that you can show us uh, the difference between sweet and sour, the difference between right and wrong, the difference between black and white. We just want to thank you for giving us that opportunity, giving us the, the spirit of discernment, giving us the uh, ability to go into your word and decipher what you're actually saying, to not look at your word and just be completely lost. We can go in and see and hear what you're saying. Father, we just want to thank you because you, we know that it's by your grace and your mercy that this is even possible to be able to go in and delve in the scriptures that you said would be hidden, and yet we see it. And Father, I just want to thank you. I know it's you who's doing this. It's you who's opening up our minds, of you who's opening up our understanding. And I want to thank you for the opportunity you have given us to be able to do these things. Father, we ask you to continue to be with us and know us from the top of our heads to the bottom of our feet. Continue to walk with us as we begin to go through these challenges that we have, help us stand strong, help us put up on the whole arm of God, help us see things the way you see them and not the way that we see them. Forgive us for our many sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In your son, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. All right. Shalom, everybody. Shalom. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom. Thank you very much. Shalom, Shalom family. In a shocking 1700s historical document of black Americans, a German professor used the term Negro as a reference to black Jews both in Africa and in Portugal. The author also makes a clear distinction between the black Jews and black Moors. The Moors were largely a distinctly different mixture of black people, most of whom had converted to the Muslim faith. The author candidly points out that the black Jews were specifically targeted for the slave trade, and that the black Moors were intentionally avoided and that the Negroes also known as Black Jews were then sent to the Americas during the slave trade. Get your ebook and audiobook bundle today. Choose from the following three options. Option 1. Get free copies of the original 1700s documents only. Option 2. Get an easy-to-read edited ebook, plus free copies of the original 1700s document for a low price of $10. Option 3. Get an audiobook for easy listening, plus the easy to read edited ebook, and also free copies of the original 1700s document for a low bundle price of $15. Learn the real history they don't want you to know.